Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this virtual community lecture where we're going to talk about weight loss management options. My name is Colette and I'm the bariatric coordinator. Um, I'm also a registered dietitian and diabetes educator. Um, we're joined tonight by expert bariatric surgeon, um, Dr. Human Solomon. Uh, before we get started, I want to let everyone know that this is an hour long presentation um, and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, please use the Q&A box to type any questions in throughout the presentation, and we'll do our best to get to each, of what, each and every question at the end. Um, just, as a, uh, just as a FYI, we will not be opening it up for attendees to speak on this particular webinar. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Solomon, I wanted to share a little bit about our program at Providence Little Company of Mary. Um, our program started in 2017 um, with the goal to provide evidence-based uh, weight loss options to the community. We are now proud to be at MBSAQIP Comprehensive Center, which means we're a nationally accredited program that meets the highest standards for patient safety and quality. Uh, we just wanted to share with you before we get started um, the impact that bariatric surgery can have on someone's life. Um, and we're going to just go ahead and share a powerful patient testimonial with all of you. I lost a total of 80 pounds thanks to a gastric bypass surgery. Having had the surgery, it turned out to be the best decision of my life. I used to go running. I live close to the beach, which I used to go running and force myself to go running. And what happened is I used to get injured quite easily. So it was a vicious cycle. Uh, when I stopped running because of, uh, because of an injury, then that forced me to, um, to not exercise for a couple of weeks. And that further led me to more weight gain. I knew I needed some help at that point. Dr. Solomon's engagement, direct engagement, and his staff were wonderful throughout the whole process. At the beginning, he told me exactly what to expect, how long um, the process will last, and, uh, and also met the nutritionist and I kept close tabs in terms of follow-up appointments. It was, it, was, it was the best experience. It really, for me, every time I drive near the facility, I have that reminiscence of that wonderful experience I had with the staff before and after. So the day of surgery, I recall it being um, scary, a little bit scary. It was the unknown. Um, I have not had any surgery for many, many years. The nursing staff at the, uh, here at the hospital was just so uh, available, so attentive to any needs. And um, uh, they, were, they were so nice at the, uh, each process, whether it's the uh, anesthesiologist, uh, the nursing staff, uh, before and after the different stages, uh, they were always there. I never felt alone. My day-to-day -day life has changed tremendously because of the fact that I'm, uh, I'm working out in the mornings. I got into a rhythm where um, I really need to work out and it, it makes me feel so much better, it relieves a lot of stress. It helps me engage on my day-to-day -day stressors at work. At the Bariatric Wellness Center at Providence Little Company of Mary Medical Center, Torrance, we understand surgery is just the beginning of a lifelong journey to better health. My son has been uh, positively influenced because when I go running with him on the beach, he likes, he actually picked up running. He does a 10K with me on a, on a Super Bowl Sunday here in Redondo Beach. So I uh, know he's definitely, uh, he sees his daddy, daddy working out and, and he joins me and I'm motivated and that feels good, that's very rewarding. For more information about these services, we're going to go ahead and put our URL in the chat box so you have that. Um, I also just want to um, let you know um, that um, the information provi provided during this seminar is educational purposes only. So you should always consult your healthcare provider if you have any questions regarding a specific medical condition or treatment. Um, now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Human Solomon. Um, a little bit about Dr. Solomon. He earned his medical degree, a Master of Science in Pathology and Master of Science in Applied Physiology at Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago, Illinois. He then completed his internship and residency in general surgery at Huntington Memorial Hospital in Pasadena. And he ended his formal education at Stanford University where he completed a fellowship in robotic, bariatric, and minimally invasive surgery. Dr. Solomon is one of a handful of weight loss surgeons worldwide to receive the prestigious title of Fellow of American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. 
He has completed over 1,500 bariatric procedures and serves as the director of our bariatric surgery program at Providence Medical Center Torrance, as well as assistant clinical professor of surgery at University of California Riverside School of Medicine. Um, we are very thankful to have him as part of our team, and I think you'll find his uh, presentation very uh, educational. All right, Dr. Solomon, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Colette. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank all of you for uh, spending part of your evening with us and learning about this uh, important topic, uh, weight loss and weight loss surgery. Um, let me <clears throat> get my presentation up. Okay, can everybody see this? I hope, cool. So um, what we're talking about is weight loss, both with help of surgery and without. So we have a program that addresses obesity as a full spectrum, that, would, that is sort of our goal. And uh, how we address it is by uh, offering surgery as well as non-surgical methods. And we're going to go into that a little bit. Um, I want to share some statistics about uh, this uh, disease. Obesity is a disease without question. Um, it is an epidemic, a very different epidemic than uh, COVID. Uh, pandemic. It is a pandemic as it's present throughout the planet in all countries. Um, its cost and its damage, the damage that obesity does, it's not immediate like COVID is, but certainly um, on our radar. Um, in the United States, three out of five adults are overweight or obese. This is a number that has been going up straight for 30 years now. Um, new data that we have involves our children. Um, this is the first generation ever that uh, children are living uh, less healthy lives than their parents did when they were children. So one in five children or teens, sorry about the typo there, are overweight and uh, or obese. This obviously is costly. We know obesity causes a lot of secondary uh, problems, medical issues. We think at a minimum, it's about $200 billion per year financial loss uh, just in the United States. And also it leads to early uh, mortality. Uh, about 300,000 deaths per year are suspected to be preventable if obesity was not part of the equation. Smoking in comparison causes 480,000, and that number, believe it or not, is uh, getting smaller every year. This is the CDC data on rates of obesity in the United States. Uh, a, they've been keeping track since 1990s, and you see um, it's almost like uh, a COVID map. Um, it's spreading not as fast as COVID, fortunately, but definitely uh, on a steady pace. And one of the more recent maps, you see how, what percentage of states are um, higher in obesity as time goes on. So obesity causes other issues, like I mentioned, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, um, sleep apnea, joint pain, and just about every organ system in the body is affected by obesity. It's a now we know that it's a direct cause of cardiac disease, uh, preventable uh, cause. And uh, there was a large study uh, where about almost 300,000 adults were followed. And the ones who were obese had the incremental increase in uh, developing cardiovascular disease, um, direct correlation. So even people that have absolutely no other issues, but their only 
get obesity going on, they are at risk of developing cardiovascular disease over their lifetime. We also know that obesity is linked to at least 13 different uh, cancers in the body, um, basically in two modalities, we think. One is hormonal, um, so obese uh, or fatty tissue in the body alters the estrogen testosterone balance in the wrong direction. And that causes uh, uh, some of these cancers. And you see certainly ovarian, uterine um, cancers, uh, possibly uh, colon and pancreas cancers, breast cancer, uh, possibly thyroid cancer. But also, we also think that fatty tissue uh, creates an inflammatory um, environment in the body. It's a chronic inflammation that it causes and it breaks down uh, cells and can also cause cancer. So it is not a surprise that the obesity um, is something that uh, as medical professionals and as a nation, we need to target. So our solution at uh, Providence to accompany Mary Torrance to this issue was to create a all-encompassing uh, program to address obesity. <clears throat> so this was started uh, almost five years ago with uh, substantial support from the hospital and the medical community. Our goal was to treat the full spectrum of um, obesity with surgical and non-surgical uh, methods and with very high uh, quality. Um, so we trained uh, and we recruited uh, surgeons, uh, uh, nurses, dietitians, psychologists. Uh, we trained the OR staff, our esteemed uh, coordinator, Colette, who was uh, preceded by uh, Jenny, who's one of our nurses now, and also a bariatric committee uh, was formulated to oversee this entire process. So that's sort of the background of how um, our program came into being. Now, I'm a surgeon by training, but I treat obesity uh, with surgery and without surgery. So we'll talk a little bit about how we treat obesity without uh, surgery. Um, we always begin by kind of getting to know uh, the challenges uh, of each patient. Uh, each individual comes with their own background, upbringing, um, cultural influences, trauma, unfortunately, that shapes a lot of our personalities and does uh, lead to obesity. So we try to spend some time it's about a 10, 12 page uh, sort of medical history for our uh, patients to fill out. And uh, once we understand what the exact challenge is, then we try to sort of tailor make this a feasible um, and sustainable solution uh, for our patients. Um, as an example, someone who's let's say in their 20s, and their challenge is uh, just food portion control is very, very different than someone who's in their 60s and they have a very slow metabolism, so to say. So this, to figure that difference takes some doing some, obviously experience, but some know-how as to um, different makeup of each individual. So once we come to formulate a, a plan, we discuss it, obviously, um, just about everyone meets with our dietitians at least once. Um, our dietitians um, are really fantastic. The, they do a great job evaluating the patients and offering solutions. Great majority of time, we can get the insurances to pay for all of this, by the way. Um, if any of it is not covered by insurance, um, we um, have discounted cash prices as well. So dietitian <clears throat> visits uh, 
is a big important first step. Next, we recommend an exercise regimen. We've actually surveyed uh, a lot of the gyms in South Bay, and we can recommend a few based on you know what the needs of the patients are. Um, we a big Part of our program is medication, weight loss medication, which now um, are a lot more and better medications available. Um, the average weight loss uh, sort of programs that you see advertised on you know, random locations in town, a lot of them are not medical uh, doctors, so they can't give you medication. So this is a huge, huge advantage um, over a lot of the other programs out there. Uh, we know there are people who um, you know, struggle with emotional eating. They sort of uh, use food for feeling better, for entertainment, et cetera. So we have psychologists uh, that participate in our program and they can assist if needed as well. And overall, um, it, we sort of, look over their shoulders uh, for a good while on a consistent basis uh, to make sure that things are going according to plan. And whenever there are issues, uh, we modify the plan. You know, it's not the rigid, it's uh, not just one size fits all, it's quite flexible. Now, for anyone who's interested in doing some work on their own, um, I want to share a few fundamental rules. We believe in uh, the rule of calories in versus calories out. If calories in are less than calories out, meaning someone takes in less calories than what they burn on average day, there should be weight loss. Now, what makes that tricky is the balance between these two things. And that is an individual's metabolism. And that makes things very complicated in some cases. So uh, the example I gave an individual in their 20s versus someone in their 60s, that's precisely where metabolism comes in. As we get older, our metabolism slows down. Women have slower metabolism to begin with. Um, for reasons that we will discuss later on. So that's um, our expertise, how to overcome that fight that the body actually puts up. And you know that's where the program uh, is designed to address. So as I mentioned, the goal of non-surgical program is to decrease total calorie intake, portion control, and uh, also intake of less calorie dense foods. Okay, so calorie dense foods are usually the stuff, the good stuff, the stuff that's not uh, really good for us, but they taste good. Anything that's rich, anything that's very sweet. And, you know, we need it. We are blessed in this country to have a lot of calorie dense food. And unfortunately, we eat too much of it as a country. So, what we want to do is cut those. So things that uh, are, for example, perfect example is a donut, a muffin, um, anything fried. So these, a small amount of it, calories, a large amount of uh, cal calories. So we want to decrease those and do the opposite with foods that are not very calorie dense. And perfect example of that is vegetables. That's sort of the idea. Uh, obviously, more involved when it comes on step-by-step, day-to-day, boots on the ground kind of a, a plan. Now, lots and lots of diets fail. Um, or they work, but they fail long-term, let's put it that way. If, if any of them work really well, there wouldn't be 100 different ones, right? So the diet, any diet plan, quote unquote diet plan works because it essentially lowers some component of our daily calorie intake. They either lower carbs, they either lower portions, they lower fats, et cetera, et cetera. They don't work because they're not sustainable because they have usually uh, 100% almost some uh, extreme component. 
So what we try to do is not do that. We are not into like extremes, um, zero carb, zero, uh, all fat, uh, zero fat, et cetera, stuff like that. Because these are, you just can't keep these up for a long time. So we try to see what approach works best. Uh, we try to sort of have a diet that's low in carb and fats, not zero, but low. And we recommend that you fill that portion that you reduced with vegetables. So a poor man's way of, you know, getting yourself started without, you know, seeing us is to uh, cut your portions. Most of your plate should be vegetable, at least half. And the rest should be small amount of carbs and a small amount of lean protein. That would be a good way to start people. Goals again <clears throat> are to maximize calorie output. Uh, flip side of the equation is uh, the calorie out part. And that's where exercise comes in. So exercise is extremely important. Most of the weight loss usually comes from the calorie in portion. The opportunity is usually uh, biggest with intake of calories. Why? Because, for example, um, if an average muffin, let's say small, moderate size, middle size muffin, will have probably 300, 400 calories, takes five minutes to eat. But to burn 400 calories, you're probably talking about a two hour walk. So you see, you have to do two hour walk to burn off a muffin, whereas you could just not eat the muffin and save yourself 400 calories. So opportunity is always uh, more available on the intake of calories, but exercise is the thing that uh, balances the other side of the equation. Um, also exercise is the thing that increases metabolism, that middle piece between the intake and output of calories, that important piece, complex piece, metabolism, the troublemaker part, that is increased by uh, exercise. I always say trying to lose weight long-term again and keeping it off without exercise is, for most people, is like driving a car with three wheels. You'll, you'll get there with a lot of noise and scratch and whatever, but you're just um, robbing yourself of this important benefit. So we recommend four to six hours a week of exercise with intensity and walking around, smelling the flowers, walking the mall does not count as exercise. It counts as activity, but it's not exercise. Exercise by definition means the heart rate has to be above a certain level in the fast pace. And the younger the person, the higher the heart rate. So let's say, Someone who's in their 20s, probably heart rate should be 150, 160, and so forth and so on. Someone in their 60s, let's say 100, 110, something like that. So that's sort of the flip side of the, that equation, the calorie output. Um, I will be the first one to say the non-surgical weight loss is harder because the only tools available are what I described, the diet and the exercise and medication sometimes. Of, of course, we're with you the whole way, but you don't have the surgery, which is this massive, very powerful tool to help you. So you have to hang in there for a long time and you have to build this program for yourself, this regimen, uh, brick by brick, part, piece by piece. And of course, you know, we would help you. So, be ready to modify things, be ready to um, up things uh, as needed. And obviously we would be there to inform you of that. Now, what's interesting is that not every diet works very well for each people, each person. Um, usually uh, men respond very well with portion control. Women, it's a lot more complicated. It's pure physiology, the fact that, you know, women need to be able to upload 
and store calories and energy when they get pregnant and then they have to do the exact opposite after they deliver so the physiology is quite challenging with women or i should say more challenging uh, also women uh, by design they don't have as much muscle mass so their metabolism is lower uh, muscle has far more metabolic rate than non-muscle tissue like fat tissue and women by nature have a lot less muscle mass so it's more challenging for a lot of our female patients to lose weight so women in short have to work harder to achieve the same results as their main counterpart also as we get older our metabolism gets slower i mentioned and again as we get older ironically you have to work harder to achieve the same results now <clears throat> we always recommend against extremes. Extremes is the thing that you can keep up for a few weeks and then you fall and you fall hard. So the plans that we recommend <clears throat> do not have anything extreme in it or we try to minimize that uh, for that exact reason. Um, and we highly recommend getting professional help, some kind of uh, trained professional to look over your shoulders. Um, as you know, I hope, if nothing else, I've conveyed to you how complicated a non-surgical uh, weight loss can be for a lot of people. Now, <clears throat> on to a surgical program. Um, I think Ms. Colette mentioned that at the end we'll have some question and answer opportunity. So uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions uh, and we'll get to those hopefully at the end. Um, again, same kind of an initial encounter. Uh, we verify insurance. You come, you know, to the office or these days uh, over the computer. We chat with you, get to know your challenges, etc. And uh, because this involves this arm of the program involves surgery, more workup is required. So EKG. Um, sometimes seeing a heart doctor, lung doctor, gastroenterologist. Uh, some x-rays, um, et cetera. Whatever is needed, that is strictly um, safety oriented. And also we know um, that a lot of the insurances have specific uh, requirements that we follow. 100% of people, again, uh, part of the insurance requirement must see a dietitian and a psychologist. And our psychologists are, you know, they have specialty training in this exact uh, arena, um, obesity and weight loss, uh, et cetera, uh, emotional eating. And uh, <clears throat> depending on the insurance requirement, there'll be monthly, sometimes bi-monthly, sometimes every other month visits with us um, where we and make sure you're on the right path as far as diet, exercise, lifestyle is concerned. And at the very end, when we feel that you're ready, when we feel that you have gained a very good understanding of the lifestyle needed to lose weight and keep the weight off, then off we go. We get authorization from your insurance to do the surgery. And you meet at the very end with our very own Colette where she discusses things pertaining to the few days before and right after the surgery, the last things that you need to know, and off we go to surgery. Um, we, by the way, we ask a lot of people to lose weight before surgery. That's sort of to prepare you physically, mentally, emotionally for what you need to do after. We, that's how um, we sort of uh, test you to see if uh, you have the right stuff uh, to you know, be successful long-term. Um, our surgeons are all board certified in general surgery with advanced training in bariatric surgery. Colette mentioned that I've done probably by now 1,600 of these outstanding results uh, for all the surgeons in the program who are nationally recognized as um, many of you may be aware. Uh, we get certified once every three years by an entity that comes and looks at our results, our training, our complications, uh, everything top to bottom in the hospital gets looked at, again, for safety reasons. 
So you are absolutely in very good hands if you choose to have your surgery with us. Um, we do almost all of these procedures with minimally invasive technique instead of you know, a large incision. Uh, we do you know, anywhere from three to five small incisions. So that makes your recovery very fast. Um, average length of stay for our patients in the hospital, you stay about 22 hours. Uh, very often you're home before one day is up. And by the time you get home, you're up and walking, you can take a shower, you can take care of yourself, um, not a lot of pain. We like someone to be with you for a couple of nights, but it is really very, very doable. And one of uh, our secret weapons um, is our specialty trained nurses um, on the first surgical unit where you'll be staying after surgery. These nurses are really outstanding and they've really embraced it and um, embraced our teachings and what we've asked of them. And, you know, very, very thankful and we feel blessed to have all of them. A little side note about our nurses and uh, patient satisfaction. We do our own internal survey of every single patient and they get 10 out of 10 stars every single time. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have a couple of gentlemen too. Um, the, what you do after surgery is a very uh, simple protocol. Um, you basically, about two hours, two to three hours after your surgery is done, you get up, walk around, uh, you start sipping on water and protein grains and stuff of that sort. And by the next day, you need to have drank a certain um, amount of water and protein. And you, that, that's how your diet starts. And over the course of next three to four weeks, we slowly advance your diet to thicker liquids and to soft foods and regular food, that's it. I mentioned length of stays about 24 hours. Uh, we see you about six times in the first year. And then we expect and hope to see every single one of our patients for life. It's something that uh, requires maintenance. This is, we're not the pro type of program, you have the surgery, off you go, you're on your own. We like to, uh, have you engaged in the program for a very good reason. And that reason is that there'll be things that come up that may push you into your old habits. And we like to be involved to guide you back and prevent weight regain. This is one of the key things in long-term weight loss maintenance that you have to stay engaged in our program. It's kind of like owning a car. You can't just buy it and put gas in it, you have to maintain it, change the oil, take it for a tune-up, etc. So we're the ones to do your tune-up. And we hope to have that opportunity for a very long time. Most of the weight, no matter what procedure you have, happens in the first six to 12 months. And it's sort of gradual, it's very safe. Um, and uh, most of the issues that come with obesity go away as you lose weight. So all comers, everything that comes with obesity, diabetes, cholesterol, back pain, neck pain, uh, snoring, all of that, about 80 to 95% of them go away depending on uh, amount of weight loss that someone has. We're gonna talk about briefly about uh, a couple of the procedures that we do. First one is called gastric bypass. The picture you see on the right, that is uh, the anatomy of gastric bypass. We basically make a small stomach, uh, which is uh, titled small gastric pouch. We make that small. Um, and then we create a detour pathway for food to go down into your uh, intestines. So normally when we eat, food goes into the stomach, uh, digestive enzymes meet with food and digestion begins immediately. With this, food goes down uh, about three to four feet before the digestive enzymes meet with food. So that delays and reduces 
um, absorption of the calories. That's one component of it, and that's called uh, malabsorption. The other component is restriction, meaning that the stomach is small, that it does not allow a large amount of food intake. Uh, lastly, there is a, horm a metabolic or hormonal component where that this rerouting of the food pathway improves uh, metabolism for a lot of people. And that's a very, very important distinction because with the next procedure we'll talk about doesn't have a strong component of metabolic influence. Don't forget, I mentioned that what complicates weight loss for a lot of people is that connection between the calorie in and out, that metabol metabolism, the troublemaker thing that we have all in our body. So that's gastric bypass. Um, we can expect to see about 75% of excess body weight loss, 95% resolution of issues, and specifically with diabetes, which is a big target for us, 80% to 85% cure of diabetes. Cure means you're off insulin, off medication, that's it. No more poking, no more nothing. So that's gastric bypass. Very safe, odds of complication, very, very low in our hands, of course, not everywhere, but in our hands. And that's that. Now, another procedure uh, that a lot of people ask about is called gastric sleeve. This is a completely different procedure. This is a procedure where we remove about 80% of the stomach. So all we do in this is make the stomach way smaller what, compared to what it was, about a fifth, of, a fifth of the size that what it was. So one, the new stomach is bigger than gastric bypass. So it's not as restricted, but it is certainly has that restriction component, meaning that um, your stomach is very smaller, so it won't let you eat um, a lot. Uh, but as you see, the rest of the intestinal tract is not changed at all. So that malabsorption component that I mentioned is not the food gets into your stomach, it's the digestive enzymes, absorption begins right away. Um, so there is no absorption here. And third, the metabolic influence that gastric bypass had is to much, much smaller degree here and in a different way. Um, basically, what happens is that part of the stomach that we remove in gastric sleeve releases a hormone that makes people hungry. It's called ghrelin, G-H-R-E-L-I-N. You see it on the screen. So that gets produced from part of the stomach. And once we remove the stomach, that hormone drops um, down quite a bit, not to zero, unfortunately. And it comes back later on. The body sort of figures out how to undo that. So that's where the metabolic component comes in. So this procedure is definitely... Um, very effective. We do a lot of this. We believe in it, but it's not as strong as gastric bypass. That's without question. So we offer this or we recommend this procedure versus gastric bypass to people that may need less help. Okay. So in the two examples that we've been talking about, someone in their 20s versus someone in their 60s, the 20 year old, 20 some year old, 30 some year old, they usually need um, uh, food portion control. And this is exactly what they need. They can exercise really well. They just need some help with portion control. And this would be, gastric sleeve would be perfect for them. Someone who's older, they have a lot of pain in their joints. They can't really exercise full speed. Their metabolism is slower because they're older. Very often uh, our female patients who struggle, they diet and they exercise and they eat salads weeks at a time and weight goes nowhere. So those need help with their metabolism. So as a result, uh, probably gastric bypass would be a better choice. At the end of the day, this, none of these are really written in stone. We try to um, guide you. Our job is to educate every single person uh, to the maximum. 
so that at the end of the day, you, whatever decide you, you decide to do, whichever procedure, you've done it in a very, very informed fashion. Whatever you decide, we will support you, help you to maximize your benefit. And that's how it's done. There's a procedure called LAPAN. Many of you have heard of it. We do not recommend this really. Um, and mainly because it doesn't work very well. It's a very inconsistent uh, result. Um, so we, before we knew the data that we know about lap band, we did a lot of these. We put these uh, in left and right. And <clears throat> after about 10, 15 years, we realized that long-term they don't work very well. So um, nowadays we don't do a lot of this. We remove a lot of these and convert the lap band to another more effective procedure. So, which brings me to the last type of surgery we do, which is called revisional surgery. If you recall, I said, this is not the kind of process you do the surgery and you're done with. Very often, um, you have to maintain it. In some rare instances, you have to correct certain things surgically. Uh, most common is when we convert the lap band to a different procedure, uh, for example, to gastric bypass, to gastric sleeve. Uh, some situations we have to convert gastric sleeve to gastric bypass. And that's a rare situation. Not so rare, but less common than conversion from lap band to something else. Usually we do the sleeve to bypass conversion for people who should have had a gastric bypass, but had a gastric sleep, and now they need it. Uh, that's the most common cause. Uh, other common cause of sleep to bypass conversion is if they develop a really bad heartburn as a result of having sleep. Small percentage of people who get gastric sleep, they end up having very bad heartburn or reflux. And those people, um, if they're a right candidate, we convert the sleeve to gastric bypass, and that usually takes care of it. Now, these, because they're reduced, they require high level of expertise. And, you know, we're very, very proud uh, to be able to do these, and we do them really well. The results are fantastic, very safe, and that's part of our program as, as well. We do have uh, this uh, other free uh, uh, service called bariatric bubble this is something that we put together as a sort of a side uh, help um, our PA Lorraine who's on maternity leave and sort of maintains it it's on Instagram Facebook um, and it's uh, in English and Spanish <clears throat> it's called bariatric bubble and it's free to anyone who wants more information on education recipes etc and we like to joke around a little bit uh, when it's the right time. So I'll leave you with this and um, Colette will take over. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. Um, I always find it very uh, fascinating, the resolution of comorbidities with surgery, uh, no matter what, how long I see it happen in the hospital and with patients post-op. It's just so interesting um, to see firsthand. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, we You're appreciate welcome. it. All right, so I'm gonna move in on to uh, our presentation on nutrition um, that I'll be sharing with you um, briefly, and then we'll get into the questions. Uh, so Dr. Solomon talked a little bit already, so I'm just gonna talk briefly. So we know that with the non-surgical and the surgical side, uh, nutrition is a critical component. Um, and you know, a lot of times people come to the first dietitian visit and they're very nervous. They don't really know what to expect. Um, they think we're going to tell them all the things that they can't eat. Um, and that's really not what it's about. It's really about getting a better understanding of your current nutrition and then looking at what nutrition ideally would be after and, and looking at a good starting point for you to help to prepare you for surgery. Um, so anything can vary, or your nutrition education can vary from anything from proper hydration um, to protein requirements that, that meet your needs um, to importance of meal planning or mindful eating. So there's so many different topics um, that they cover in the nutrition visit. Um, and it's really to make it catered for you to find something that works for you that's sustainable. 
we also know, um, as Dr. Solomon mentioned, um, there's there's oftentimes a preoperative weight loss requirement. And you know, this really isn't to prove that you can adhere to any certain diet. We know you've tried lots of different diets on your weight loss journey thus far, but really it's to help reduce um, surgical risk factors and improve outcomes. So it's to make the surgery safer um, for you and easier for the surgeon um, in addition um, to changing habits. Um, so there is research to support that when you make these small behavior changes prior to surgery um, that are linked to nutrition and physical activity, you have more success with losing weight and keeping it off. And, and really that's what we want for you is to the keep it off part, right? A lot of people come to their first nutrition, they say, I know how to lose weight. Um, I know what diets work for me, but it's the keeping it off part. And that's why we wanna avoid those extremes um, that Dr. Solomon mentioned. And we really wanna find something that's sustainable. Um, so we talked a little bit about energy balance or Dr. Tal Solomon talked a little bit about that. Um, but when you go to that dietitian visit, um, we're going to look at nutrition kind of from this broad perspective. So it's looking at our current intake patterns, our knowledge, attitudes, our relationship with food, um, when we eat, why we eat that way. Um, our physical activity levels, our social and family support. So it is about what we eat, but it's about why we eat too. And it's about how we eat um, and the timing that truly impacts our nutrition as a whole. Um, so some nutrition basics um, that you might explore at that um, first dietitian visit. So one of the most proven behavioral um, intervention strategies for weight management is self-monitoring. So oftentimes that's something that we'll ask you to do. And that is really just tracking, writing down, um, recording your eating and exercise patterns, and then having some self-reflection about that to really start becoming aware of of your current patterns and what needs to be changed to prepare you for long-term weight loss. Um, I think as Americans, um, we really mastered eating while doing something else. So mindful eating is something that we use as a principle in our teaching um, with the dietitians. Um, you might also have heard of intuitive eating, but these are concepts that you can explore um, at that dietitian visit. Um, also looking at balanced meals. What does that look like before surgery versus after? Um, what is balanced, right? There's so many different um, definitions of that. And we'll really look at that. What is balanced for weight loss and what is balanced for long-term surgery? Um, we'll take a look at your current meal patterns. Are you one of those people who eats one meal a day? Um, are you more of a five to six meals a day? So we'll look at your current meal patterns and then look at after surgery optimally what would that look like for you? Um, and then getting you started on practicing that ahead of time so it's not such a big um, change after surgery. And then regular exercise, like Dr. Solomon mentioned, it is such a key in keeping the weight off. Um, I would say that's a commonality of the patients that we see that are successful long-term three, four, five years after surgery. So these are just some nutrition um, basics that you can possibly learn and explore um, in your dietitian visit. So I talked a little bit, I mentioned balanced meals and I wanna save some time for questions. So I'm not gonna to get too detailed into this, um, but really looking at the plate a little bit differently now. Um, and I always tell people, you know, you don't have to start with all your meals. You don't have to revamp breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Maybe you just start with one. Okay, with dinner, I'm gonna start trying to make my plate with more vegetables. I'm gonna focus on that lean protein and that starch or fruit. Um, I think making these small changes and not overwhelming ourselves with having to revamp everything is also important to that sustainability aspect. Um, after surgery, your plate's obviously going to look a little bit different. Um, one of the reasons you just don't have as much room, um, and we really want you to focus on getting your protein food first. Um, so typically two to three ounces of protein is what we'll recommend. And then if there's room and there's space, um, choosing non-starchy vegetables. Um, so those are the ones that are lower in carbs. 
and higher in fiber. And then if you're still hungry and you still have room, something like a higher fiber fruit and whole grain. Now this wouldn't be right after surgery and we're gonna get into that briefly. This would be once you're on your new regular diet um, post-op. So about you know six weeks out to surgery, you would start with the protein food first and then kind of that, that balance there. So nutrition after surgery, um, Dr. Solomon mentioned, but we do have you follow a pretty strict um, diet progression for those first four to six weeks. And this is to allow your body to heal and recover. So you discharge home from the hospital um, on liquids. So we have you drinking protein shakes and water. And then over the course of that first month, we'll have you progress the, to different textures all with an emphasis on protein um, and hydration, especially within that initial post-op period. So just some golden, um, we call them the golden rules of bariatrics. Um, you wanna really focus on eating at planned meal times, um, allowing a lot longer to take to eat your meal. So, you know, how many of us take 20 or 30 minutes per meal now? Probably not um, that common. Um, we have vitamin and mineral supplementation that we recommend taking for life. Um, we really emphasize um, adequate hydration. Um, it's very easily, especially in the early post-operative period to not get enough water. So that's something we really um, push is making sure that you're staying hydrated those first few weeks at home and really throughout um, the course of your journey after surgery. Um, exercise, Dr. Solomon talked a little bit about that. Um, you can see kind of the guidelines there. Um, avoiding concentrated sweets um, and refined carbs. Um, chewing slowly and thoroughly. Um, that's really important after surgery. So your, um, with your changes in anatomy and just what happens physiologically, you're not gonna be breaking down your food quite as well. So you have to do it um, physically more by chewing your food um, a little bit better eating a balanced diet, like we mentioned, listening to your body. Um, that's a big one. Um, we have long-term support, um, like Dr. Solomon mentioned, after surgery. Um, and we have um, regular support groups post-op, only support groups where we'll talk about some of these concepts. So we'll talk about what does listening to my body look like when it comes to um, the post-op period? And how do I become aware of these changes and stopping when I'm full? Um, and then getting enough protein in. So that's really gonna be an emphasis, whether you're pre-op or post-op really, um, it's kind of a key to any uh, weight loss diet, whether you go the non-surgical route or surgical route. So these are just some of the basics. It's a lot to cover in just a few minutes, um, but just to give you a starting point on there. And then I also just wanted to share a few um, of our patients that have come through the program. Um, so this is Erica. Um, she's been amazing at sharing her story with us. She had gastric bypass in 2018. This is honestly my favorite part um, of, the, of being in my position because I get to stay in touch with you guys and really see the transformation that happens not only physically, but mentally with um, you know, the, the weight loss that comes with it and people living a better life. This is um, Claudia who had surgery uh, four years ago. She's lost 151 pounds. Um, Christiane, she just celebrated her one year anniversary um, and has lost a total of 70 pounds. Gallo, who we uh, you know, met in the video. And this is Mia, who's a few years out and also often comes and does uh, answers uh, Q&A at our support groups and Inga as well, who had surgery in 2018. So, so many um, beautiful faces that come through our program who are just so excited to share their story with others. So that's why we like to, to share them with you. Um, and so, yeah, thanks for, for letting us share that with you. So before we begin on the Q&A, we have a few questions for you. So if you could please answer the poll that you see on your screen and give us your honest feedback, um, we would appreciate it. Um, so now we'll go ahead and begin our, our Q&A once you answer those questions. So you can go ahead and just type any questions that you have into the chat. Don't see any just yet. This may be the first time ever, no questions. 
You covered it all, Dr. Solomon. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> so it could be anything related to the surgery, the process, um, related to the nutrition, non-surgical, anything really. We have a few more minutes if you wanted to. I'll, um, okay. We sometimes get questions about caffeine and alcohol. Yeah. Um, we usually, after surgery, recommend no caffeine or alcohol for three months. Um, that's basically uh, to let your new stomach heal properly. Um, after the uh, um, three, three months, um, then, you know, it both are allowed caffeine and alcohol. We recommend usually maybe one cup of coffee per day and also alcohol in really, really very uh, great moderation, maybe once a week and no more than that. Um, mainly because alcohol is kind of the worst type of calorie you could take in. Uh, it's liquid, uh, it's kind of carb. It will, you know, make you tipsy and then you don't may have the best judgment. You makes you eat more. So it's not the best thing. You could absolutely have alcohol, but it's not really the best thing. So we did have a couple of questions come in. Uh -huh. um, any age restrictions, if you wanted to answer that one? There is no age restriction. We do anyone over 18, anyone close to 18, 19, or just under 18, we sort of try to take our time uh, they there's sort of a uh, maturity level that's required it's a lot of details to follow and you know we ask for a good deal of parental involvement if they're teenagers upper age limit there is none we recently did someone who was uh, 79 that's probably the oldest person we've done um 71 uh, I think lady, female, Miss Dawn, uh, not a problem. Uh, does PPO insurance cover the cost of surgery? Yes, um, not all. So the initial uh, part of our uh, encounter with you is we get your insurance uh, information and we verify so that there are no surprises. We don't like to upset you guys. We're not the type of program to you know tell you yeah you're covered and then surprise you at the end that we do not like to do so we verify but many ppo and non-ppo plans uh, as well as medicare they do cover weight loss surgery and then how um, about the um determining eligibility um for for either but for bypass and sleep it would be the same but would you explain a little bit about that yes of course so there is insurance criteria and they're very strict about that. Um, so they go by body mass index or BMI, basically the ratio of height to weight. Any one of you can look it up online. Uh, you plug in your height uh, and your weight and it spits out your BMI. If you have BMI of 40 or higher, um, you meet insurance criteria. If you have BMI 35 to 40, then you need what's called a comorbidity. Usually those include diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea. Those are the main ones that are usually accepted. But we look at that also and let you know. And I'll let you yeah, I can tell me what to question. answer. Ms. Um, I think we answered the PPO one. Um, how about, so what is a gastric pouch made of? natural tissue or synthetic and what happens to a larger stomach that is not in use what happens to that larger stomach good question so the gastric pouch is made of your own stomach so we just sort of cookie cut it off the main stomach we sort of detach it with a special device that seals and cuts and that becomes your new stomach it is pretty much the size of your thumb, maybe two thumbs next to each other. Physically, that's the size, but obviously stomach has this capacity to stretch. So it allows for food, but it's very, very tiny. And the, what we call the remnant stomach, the remainder of the stomach just sits there. 
doesn't do a whole lot. Not, nothing wrong with leaving it. We, people ask why you don't take that out is because it's quite involved to remove that section of the stomach and the end part. To make it skinny in gastric sleep, not a big deal, but to remove the entire, that uh, it's, it's quite involved. So I know we're right at 6.30, but if you guys wanna um, hang out, we can finish answering a few more questions. So just wanted to share that as well. So sure, sure. Um, uh, how um, restricted is activity after surgery and for how long? Um, like an example, like just lifting your children or something like that. Well, it depends. If, uh, if you want me, I'll tell your spouse, you're not allowed to lift kids anymore. It'll cost you 10 bucks, but I'm kidding. Uh, for the first three weeks, there is no exercise uh, or heavy lifting, meaning more than 20 pounds. Um, that's, you're not going to undo your surgery or hurt yourself. It just will hurt. So that's what we recommend. After three weeks or so, full uh, exercise is allowed, no restrictions whatsoever. Um, I think that was it, right? Yeah. One other question. So what are complications if um, after a gastric bypass, if you overeat, for example? Uh, pain. You will regret it. It, it will hurt. You will have pain. You'll vomit. Um, so if somebody, to be honest, if somebody puts their mind to it, they can stretch their itty bitty pouch to almost the size, uh, to a size that there is no more restriction. So that is a problem. Um, we, uh, part of uh, what we do after surgery is to encourage you to listen to your new signal for being full. And it comes a lot faster because your stomach is a lot smaller. And as long as you pay attention to your body, um, you proactively keep your portion small. I usually say the size of your fist, men, you know, a little bit bigger than women. Um, and you practice keeping the portion small like this, you serve yourself this much, the odds of stretching the pouch is not high. Um, so yeah, but overeating, you very quickly learn that you should not have done that. And is there a surgical option that is reversible? Yes, so gastric bypass is reversible. We don't intend on reversing these procedures because uh, we are treating a medical issue. Uh, it's like saying uh, you want, God forbid someone has cancer, they want a reversible surgery for their cancer. Um, it's that, that type of thinking we have. So we don't intend to reverse it, but gastric bypass is the one that's reversible. Thank you, a couple more. Um, yeah. Does the remnant stomach shrink in size? Uh, to a small degree, but it has it. If you ever were to put, you know, reconnect everything, it would be fully functional. I'm confused. Would I want to come to you if I don't want surgery? You're welcome to, yes, uh, if you want to be part of our non surgical program. Yeah, so we do surgical weight loss and non-surgical weight loss. There is some things, what yeah, are so the leakage possibilities? So leaks in reputable programs like ours in expert hands uh, are very, very rare. Never zero, um, but very rare uh, to the point that we are not asked to keep track of them anymore. So they keep, they ask us, to keep track of all complications, let's say blood transfusion, if someone stays in the hospital for too long, God forbid something bad happens, but they stop asking for leaks because it's so rare now. It is definitely a possibility. We usually quote in our hands, 1% um, for less risk of leak. And then we can just finish it up with the last question. So typical out of pocket cost. Good question. That strictly depends on your insurance plan. Um, so each plan comes uh, with their own set of deductibles and restrictions. 
Um, we are in network with the great majority of the big plan, uh, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Cigna, Aetna. We're in network with those. So uh, when you are in network, then um, the out-of-pocket usually is smaller. Nevertheless, since uh, Affordable Care Act went into effect, most insurance companies have raised the out-of-pocket amount. That's the unfortunate uh, thing that has happened. But um, by the time the workup is done, et cetera, a lot of your out-of-pocket deductible is met. So usually it turns out not to be very high. What is the weight limit for surgery? Um, so we have capped the upper weight limit, I think this gentleman uh, or this uh, individual is asking. Uh, upper weight limit at our program is 450 pounds, correct? Ms. Colette? Yeah, so we've put an upper limit on it just because uh, you know some of the imaging uh, machinery that we use, they may have some restrictions if somebody, someone is very heavy. That's really the reason. So if someone is over 450 pounds, we help them lose weight to come down to 450 or lower, and then uh, you have your surgery. Great, thank you for answering all those questions. Um, and thank you to those of you who asked questions. I'm sure you're not the only one that had um, the same question. So we appreciate everyone for that. Um, a big thank you to Dr. Solomon um, for taking the time to provide us with this valuable information. Um, sure. We will be sending a recording of the presentation to all attendees um, for you to have. Um, so you can kind of go back and, and listen to it for the parts that you found most interesting. Um, and we will be also posting this on our Facebook page for everyone to view and share. Um, you can find us at Little Company of Mary South Bay on Facebook. Um, and for additional information or to schedule a physician appointment, um, please call our patient engagement center or at 1-888-HEALING, or you can directly um, reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy um, to help answer, you know, more individualized questions and get you started in either the non-surgical or surgical side of the program. So um, I can type my number um, into the chat there um, and feel free um, to reach out to me as well. Um, uh, thank you everyone for coming um, and thank you for your participation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.